Why not ask you about Deion Sanders and, and his kids and what he's doing in Colorado? I, I've seen some people uh, on social media are, are kind of thinking he's selfish. I played with Deion. I think he's a fabulous guy. Um, I, I, I've found him to be genuine over the last 25 years. I, I wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, Deion Sanders going from a historically black college to Colorado. Um, do you think that's good for college football? Yeah, well, I feel like no one was going to be happy whenever he did leave. Because, of course, if he ever left the black college, it's always going to be about abandoning that whole mission. And I thought it was a great time for Dion to move on and go to the next chapter of his career. And Dion, Dion is a, an acquired taste. It, it's all dependent on who you are. If, if you're a fan of Dion Sanders, I know Kanye West used to say this a lot, if you're a fan of Dion Sanders, you're a fan of yourself. And that, to me, is what Dion is, is he's a guy who believes in himself. He believes in the player that he brings into the program. And to be honest with you, sometimes to some people that are trying to view his message in a certain way, they're never going to understand Dion Sanders. But if you look at the way Colorado is playing, everyone's motivated. Everyone's excited. That whole Travis Hunter situation at the sideline, ugly tackle, right, a little late hit, ends up hurting Travis Hunter. Everyone's looking at him and saying, that's a great opportunity. Dion could have piled on and maybe said something bad about a kid. Instead, he comes out and he defends people. That's just the type of guy Dion is. And I've always known Dion to be a great person. So anytime I get an opportunity to talk about him and what he's doing at Colorado, I'm always going to praise him. Talk about just his sons and the difficulty. We know your dad, and we know that you've been carving out your own lane here in the world of baseball, especially baseball media. But the the trials and tribulations of trying to uh, be in the same kind of world as where your dad or where Dion's sons' dad were was at at such a level where there's – Obviously, some things that benefit, but there's some things that detract from what you're doing as well. Speak on that for Shador and, and Shiloh and how well they've played and kind of rose above all of that. Yeah, Shador and Shiloh, they're going to show up to the football field, and there are going to be plenty of people who already show up to the yard believing that you are where you are because of your dad. And now some of that might be true, but at the same time, when you go out and you can create – and you can perform at that level. Deion Sanders is well aware when he first started having kids, when I put kids out there, they're going to be targets. They may reap the benefits of being Deion Sanders' child, but at the same time, there are drawbacks. You are going to have to prove yourself. You're going to have to pave your own lane, pave a road for yourself, and you're going to have to show some people. Well, some people may never be convinced. And that doesn't matter. But what actually matters is the way you think of yourself. And when you saw that pick six this past weekend, Deion Sanders knew that that was a moment where one of his kids felt like he paved his own way. And that was important. And, of course, me being Gary Sheffield Jr., I had some moments like that in my baseball career as well. And I can only say I can't describe how good it feels. Talking to Gary Sheffield Jr. from Outkick.com, covers sports. <clears throat> I wanted to ask you about Heim Bloom being let go by the Boston Red Sox. Uh, did some dirty work for them. Things weren't working out, and he becomes the fall guy. But kind of the state of some of these teams that have spent massive amounts of money, Mets, Yankees, Red Sox, uh, where do they go? When you're already at the bottom, uh, you can only go up. But, I, I mean, you know, you, you've already heard Steve Cohen talking about uh, he's learned a lot in the two years he's owned the New York Mets. But for the Boston Red Sox, where do, you, where do you go after you get rid of a guy that you brought in to try to change the culture and change the way you did business? Well, you know what's amazing is part of that culture in Boston is, let's, let's be clear, they, they scapegoated change, in my opinion. And they didn't allow him to do some things that, frankly, he wanted to do. He wanted to keep Mookie Betts. Like a lot of these, a lot of these guys, they, they want to they keep those guys around, make some aggressive moves in the offseason, maybe pick up a free agent. You saw how long Rafael Devers, they were just sitting there pattering their feet for Devers, and then eventually they struck a deal. Boston, in general, is not moving like a major market team. And for a team that's won as many World Series championships since 2004 as they've won, you would expect something different. I think their fans expect something different. 
And right now, I don't even know which direction they look. But as far as I'm concerned, the Red Sox are going to be looking for somebody who can maybe execute some trades, almost like a middle market team, and find ways to find impact. And right now, Chain's not doing that. They're in last place behind my god-awful New York Yankees. And once they can do that, I think, I think they found their guy. New York Yankees, I feel like they're having a tryout for the next couple of weeks or maybe this whole month of September. Yeah. If that's the case, who do you think's made the team? Hey, I mean, Jason Dominguez, obviously, you saw that, the whole thing with the UCL. Having to get Tommy John was obviously devastating. I mean, he was paving his, himself as the starting center fielder of the New York Yankees. That's what we wanted. Anthony Volpe, he's shown flashes this year. Maybe not a great batting ever, something that me and you might care about as old school fans of the game. But for all the analytical nerds, Jace, uh, Anthony Volpe showed exactly what needs to be shown. He can drive the ball, he can field, maybe he doesn't have the best arm, but he's at shortstop instead. And the Yankees have plenty of moves. Maybe John Carlos Stan, they move on from that deal. The Yankees have plenty of moves that they can make to get themselves back into contention. But right now, they've, they've got too many guys clogging the lineup and, and really getting paid big money to play um, mediocre baseball. Well said. New York Mets are in the same boat. They seem to be the the biggest player maybe in Shohei Otani. Uh, he went off and just got his elbow surgery, said, all right, I can hit next year and I can pitch in 2025. Um, he may have lost a little bit of money with the injury, but where do you, where do you see Shohei going next year? I, I feel like it's either Dodgers or Mariners. I understand why people keep talking about Steve Cohen and the Mets, in large part because they're probably going to be the highest bidder. I don't think Steve Cohen... I know everyone keeps saying, hey, why don't you sprinkle around some assets? But I think Steve Cohen looks at this and says, if I go get Shohei Otani, I'm not taking steps back in the other parts of the roster the way another organization might. And that makes sense. So they may be the highest bidder, but from Otani's perspective, he's, he's not leaving the Angels potentially over money. He's leaving because he can't win. Now, the New York Mets haven't done any winning recently, so I can't see why he would leave his West Coast preference to go play for a team who hasn't proven they can win. So do I like what the New York Mets did at the deadline by essentially punting to 2025 and getting some prospects? They basically bought prospects, which was awesome for them. But why would Shohei Otani buy into that program in another rebuild when he can just sign with the Dodgers, have Freddie Freeman, Mookie Betts, and a bunch of cast of characters that are going to help him win right this second? So if I had to guess, if I'm a betting man, I'm going Dodgers, Mariners. Who are you most afraid of right now with a week left in the regular season? I mean, some of the, the teams have already set their spot for the playoffs with Rangers, Mariners, Blue Jays still battling out for two spots in the AL. The NL wild card is just so up in the air for these last weeks of, of baseball. But who do you really like right now? Is the, This team is clicking. This team is healthy. This team is poised to win a World Series. I'm not going to lie to you. Philadelphia, for whatever reason, has my attention. And the reason I say that is that guy, Trey Turner, who did nothing in the first half of the season, I think Philadelphia did a little bit of an experiment with their fans trying to root for him and just show them that they support him. Ever since that moment, Trey Turner has been Trey Turner. He's been the guy that they gave that $300 million plus million contract to. And when that's happening at the top of the lineup, you got a Kyle Schwarber, who we already know what he can do. And then, of course, Bryce Harper, the – multiple-time MVP winner, they've got a lineup that can contend with Atlanta. Now it's a matter of if they can pitch. In the postseason, every once in a while, a team will find some guys to get them out. Maybe a Ranger Suarez. You never know who exactly in Philadelphia can do that for them. But if they can get some outs in Philly, they're dangerous to anyone. Rangers Mariners tied right now. Rangers and the Red Sox, it's 4-3 right now uh, as we're doing this interview. Um, and I just want to say, I'm, I'm surprised the Rangers kind of fell off, but I'm not surprised Bruce Bochy's got these guys fighting uh, to try to get that third slot in the wild card. Who do you like between the Rangers and Mariners uh, if they do get into the wild card? Oh, man, in my opinion, that's the Mariners. And that's in large part because their starting rotation is just so much better. And, of course, a lot of that has to do with health. I mean, who thought? Texas is going to have to deal with injuries. I mean, maybe Jacob DeGrom is a little more predictable. But obviously, you make a deal for Max Scherzer. Now he's out with a strain. He's out for the rest of the year. I think they even said in the postseason he's not coming back. So that's, that's pretty disappointing. 
Now, if Texas is going to be in contention and be a danger to anyone, they're going to have to slug their way to win some series. Now, does that scare people? Yeah, of course. But I think pitching, having top flight arms like a Luis Castillo who just got his 200K yesterday, those type of arms, those big arms that you can rely on to go deep into games in the sixth and seventh inning, those are the series you don't want to be in. And I think Seattle, the team right now that people are going to be penciling and saying, I think that's the team we want to avoid. A team that no one really talks about ever, and they're always going to be there in the playoffs, and we still just scratch our heads and say, how in the hell are they still doing it? Tampa Bay has lost so many people once again. Wander Franco, bye bye uh, Series on the IL. Was it Yandy Diaz? It just, McClanahan. McClanahan's gone. A Cy Young contender. Yandy Diaz fouled one off into his groin just recently. Like, he bruised his testicle. Dude, this team <laughs> is walking wounded, but they still collect wins. How did they keep doing it like what is their secret sauce in your opinion it's what they do with the bullpen you know it really reminds me of those san francisco giants teams in 2012 and 2010 where you'd make it halfway through the year you see they've got 94 95 wins and they get in with with bochi in the in the boat and you know he's just sitting out there in the dugout and you're like why is this team finding ways to just completely eviscerate the postseason and in large part, it's how you manage the bullpen. And they're doing a great job. If you watch Tampa play, and I know there's not many people watching them, they are not a sexy baseball game to watch. They will come out there. They'll throw a starting pitcher you've never heard of with a five-something ERA. They'll bring them out in the third. And then they'll bring out power arms from the fourth on. And you'll sit around and wonder, we haven't scored since the fourth. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, that, that's why. And when you get into the playoffs, maybe they haven't cashed in and won a World Series, but Tampa's always been dangerous in the postseason. And that's because they know how to pitch. They know when to pull a string, when not to. And frankly, when you have guys that understand analytics rather than abusing it, it brings you a long way. Talking to Gary Sheffield Jr. from OutKick.com, my final one for you, Gary, is Braves, Dodgers. They're both uh, Braves are up 15 games, won their division a few weeks ago. Uh, lo- locked it up. Dodgers did the same thing. They're up 14 games on the Diamondbacks. Who do you like coming out of the National League between the Braves and Dodgers? I'm going to go with the obvious pick. I'm going Braves. The Braves are a team where their starting rotation is going the other way. Uh, I can't say for them it's in terms of health. Guys are coming back. But obviously at L.A. with what happened with Urias and being on the sidelines and not being able to perform for this team. And of course, the rest of their starting pitching in L.A. Is, is getting up there in age. I've just got to roll with the young guys. And, of course, Atlanta's got a pitcher in Max Freed who's pitching for a contract. When you've got a guy who's pitching for a contract and you're enter, entering into October with that lineup, Atlanta is the most dangerous team. Now, I can't. It's, it's hard to say, oh, the most dangerous team is the best team and the most hungry, but the way Atlanta plays, they just find ways to look like the most hungry team. They play harder than you. They run the bases harder than you. And then, of course, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt having a Cooney at the top of the lineup. That'll, that'll make you look good. So I'm just going to go with Atlanta, and I think they're a better team overall than L.A. Is the 40-40 club still cool? Acuna Jr.'s one home run away yep. from making it into that club. And Dibs and I were talking about no hitters, if those were still cool, as much as people try to just take their – Then Snell. Snell got lifted last night, had a no hitter through the seventh. But 40-40, is that still cool to you? It's still cool to me. I don't want to discount it. I think we can all agree stealing a base is a little bit easier. Bases are bigger. You can't pick off more than twice. So there's all types of different details as to why guys are stealing more bases. We all understand it. But is it still really cool? Is it really impressive? Absolutely. And it's in large part why Ronald Acuna is going to win the MVP this year. He stole a lot of bases, hit a lot of home runs, and played great defense. So when you do that, I have to be impressed. Gary, love talking sports with you, my man. We appreciate your time, and and good luck, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, buddy. Anytime.